Welcome. Thank you for coming, everybody. It's a, it's a very important day because um, robotics has been uh, already brought in the Collège de France by quite a number of uh, high-level roboticians in the last 10 years. But today, as um, Professor Lemont, Lemont said, we are very happy to have this incredibly prestigious panel of roboticians. Now, the first speaker uh, of this uh, meeting will be Professor Paolo Dario. Uh, he's a, uh, oh, we should put your slide on, Paolo. Why don't you put your computer on? Yeah. Monsieur, où est-ce qu'il est, monsieur? Professor Dario is uh, uh, presently the director of a very large robotics lab in the Scuola Superior Santa Anna in Pisa. He has also created a very large robotic lab that all of us know in Pontedera in Italy. But, uh, and has, over the years, created many international cooperations and particularly uh, with I Japan and Professor Takanishi, uh, with whom uh, his group has uh, had many cooperation and we have been very happy to participate in some of these projects. Professor Dario has also organized many robotics conferences, which all of them had a spirit of interdisciplinary uh, uh, confrontation and cooperation. He is at the frontier of bio-inspired robotics with the originality that what he has always looked for is cross-fertilization, the exchange of ideas, technologies between the, co the two communities. And in particular, he has been the coordinator of the very famous large European projects called Neuro Robotics, with, I think, Paulo seven robotics lab and six labs in neuroscience among some of the best. He is presently the coordinator of the flagship project Robocom, which has been selected among six projects to be candidates for one of the largest uh, potential projects that Europe has ever launched, once more with a very interdisciplinary spirit. And in all his work, he has always promoted circulation of young people between communities which is so important for the development of all our uh, disciplines. He has also been here in this house, invited professor at the Collège de France, elected by the Assembly of Professors for one month and gave beautiful lectures. In other words, he is a man promoting cross-fertilization between many disciplines. He is a true Renaissance man and a faithful friend. Merci, Paolo. Thank you very much, Professor Bertoz. It's a real privilege. Uh, and I share your uh, opinion that this is a, will be a memorable event. And uh, we all have to be uh, thankful to Jean-Paul Mond for organizing uh, this and uh, uh, certainly collecting a uh, uh, number of, uh, at least the senior, I think, distinguished uh, uh, scientists who essentially uh, contributed to create uh, uh, robotics as it is. Uh, <clears throat> the title of my talk is Science and Technology of Robot Companions. Actually, as Professor Bertoz pointed out, uh, I, I, I was honored to be uh, a visiting professor at the Collège de France for one year, six years ago. And during this time, uh, um, probably the best uh, uh, result that I got, because you know, having this privilege of uh, having a chair in this place where interdisciplinary education is at best, is to have the opportunity of, it's a sort of mini sabbatical, or sometimes even more, in which you <clears throat> try to uh, put together the ideas and to look forward. And in a way, this is what I did. Actually, in 2006, my course was called the Science uh, the Engineering of Biorobotics. And, and you see, those are 
in these slides are the milestone of biorobotics because you know I think that uh, uh, an important role of, uh, of uh, uh, professors is not only to uh, um, do research uh, uh, and to educate students but also to have a strategy, a vision for the future in a field. And this is what essentially we, we are all trying to do. So this is a, um, actually a sort of uh, a roadmap, if you will, or pathway of robotics as I participated myself <clears throat> and contributed uh, in, in part. So you will see, and I'm going to uh, uh, share with you uh, many steps of uh, this evolution uh, that also Professor uh, Bertoz, uh, uh, Professor Lomond outlined uh, in, in robotics. As I said, in 2006, uh, we organized uh, the first uh, uh, conference on uh, uh, bio-robotics. Uh, and uh, also I gave a lecture at ICRA on uh, biorobotics and this course uh, in uh, biorobotics, uh, science and engineering here at the college. So uh, I tried and had the opportunity to investigate and to try to make a definition of what the biorobotics, science and engineering is, and you can read here. But actually more than the definition, I think what really counts are what you do and how you materialize these definitions and the field. So biorobotics is, uh, is, uh, is more than just the biomedical robotics or medical robotics. It's, it's, it's more in this sense because the biological system is central. Biological system can be humans or can be uh, animals, but essentially uh, the role of uh, engineers, I mean, new role of engineers, especially in biomedical engineering, but also in emerging disciplines, is to analyze these models and uh, from using engineering tools and uh, develop uh, uh, models. Which kind of models? Uh, physical models, and these models can be biomedical robots, like for example, surgical robots. Those are just machines that are aimed to substitute or augment or restore the cap missing capabilities of a biological system, a human, for example. Or this model can be used to develop a bio-inspired robot. And some bio-inspired robots, some of them, not all, <clears throat> have applications. And then there is a subtle uh, new uh, field that at the beginning was a, <clears throat> a bit controversial, if you, if you will. Uh, it is to develop a physical model of the biological system that could be not just a bio inspired but truly biomimetic, that is coping, corresponding as much as possible to the biological system so that it could even be used to validate the validity of the engineering model. So in this sense, you see, we have engineering on the right and we have science sort of, I'd say, because obviously we are not talking about high energy physics science. And we are talking to scientific method, however, to uh, validate hypotheses. So in this sense, the robot is a tool to validate a scientific hypothesis. So it becomes a scientific tool. And uh, this is, a, is something different, because in the past, and I remember very well my Kairochi, I mean, all my old, meaning that I'm old and we worked together for years, uh, friend and colleagues, you know, we elaborated a lot about that. You know, could robotics be a science? There, was, uh, there were many hypotheses of how robotics could be a science. Well, this is one of those, in my opinion. So robotics can be a science if it can be used as an instrument to validate scientific hypotheses. So uh, it's part of the story, but it's a very practical, uh, uh, say, uh, working hypothesis on how robotics can be that. So um, <clears throat> bio, I started with biorobotics, then I move into robot companions, because robot companions may be a further step, as, as Professor Bertoz pointed out, uh, even more visionary and committing um, uh, challenge for the robotics community. But we start from biorobotics uh, that emerges after the birth of modern robotics almost uh, uh, 50 years ago, 
um, and uh, the establishment of industrial robotics and the establishment or the, the emergence of service robotics. Actually, here I come in the scene. I mean, my uh, first work in robotics are early 80s, and actually, uh, early 80s are also uh, the time in which most of the robotics community started to work. Uh, first, uh, using industrial robots as uh, uh, a, a tool to develop uh, uh, theories and techniques for robot control. This was really the first effort in, uh, in the robotics community. And of course, the industrial robots worked in a structured environment. This was essentially the, 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 the difference. Uh, while the next step was to try, and this was really very early investigation, to, to create theories and techniques for robot perception and action control in a structured environment, because this was really the challenge. So moving from structured environments to unstructured environments. And this was the research effort. At that time, in uh, many labs, uh, uh, there was an effort of developing very early components. And this was also my own, uh, uh, say, uh, approach to robotics. I started by developing sensors, you know, like uh, many students. Uh, I started with a tactile sensor that already had uh, some very uh, interesting, I think, I mean, this was said by, by, by uh, colleagues. Uh, uh, it was a multi-layer, multifunctional, and it was intended to imitate skin. But the sensor alone could not work, uh, uh, and so I started with my colleagues and, and, and students to develop hands hence as a way of uh, moving the sensor to explore the world. This was uh, uh, my, my uh, original uh, attention. And then if you, were, if you develop a hand, you need to develop an arm. And so we developed an arm. And this arm, by the way, 1991, was the first startup company that my own students created. And now they have 50 employees, uh, relatively successful. So, of course, not as uh, the iRobot uh, uh, company of uh, Rodney. But certainly, it was an interesting case. And uh, like the next one, that is putting together the, the arm and the hand and the sensor with a mobile base and developing something that was also designed. This was, in my opinion, to my knowledge, the first case of a robot that was designed not by engineers, but by engineers with industrial designers. It's something that uh, uh, already that was expected you know, to uh, uh, investigate not only functionality, but also acceptability by uh, the, the users. And uh, in fact, uh, we were able at that time to integrate everything and to make tests with real users, in this case, disabled users. If you wish, in the nutshell here, there is everything, because there, there are components, systems, design, user-centered design, acceptability, human factor, social factors. This is robotics, in a way. That is a metaphor of, uh, of uh, life in the broad sense. Uh, it's something that can be considered also like this, not only an industrial machine, but something that really is a, an assistant, even one could say a companion of humans eh, to some extent. We can discuss about that. I have ideas that are maybe not, uh, uh, I mean, I, I really believe in the, in the role of uh, the assistantship eh, to, to humans. But you see here in a few years already, what uh, is actually my own uh, uh, contribution to robotics. Right? Of course, there is a lot of science, a lot of, you know, there is a lot of engineering at the beginning. Uh, so, so we are talking about 94, 97, and uh, there's uh, uh, already a European partnership uh, uh, putting at work different uh, uh, groups with different uh, skills. And now, what, what we did, you know, from here, you see, from a very controlled environment to 
a real place. You see uh, women with their shopping bags uh, 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 walking together with robots in a real setting. And this is something I'm very proud of. Uh, to my knowledge, this is probably the first case in the world in which uh, a service robot, this one is for garbage collection, has been working for two months continuously uh, involving real families, so not realistic, but real users uh, and collecting, um, doing real services for people for time. You know, this, in a way, this is really challenging because uh, it requires a lot of uh, uh, pr solving a lot of problems, uh, not, and, and not only engineering problems. Uh, in, in a way, this shows the maturity of robotics, you know, that is not only in a lab but is, uh, is, uh, is reaching out to real people, uh, talking with uh, citizens, institutions, uh, insurance companies, uh, uh, lawyers, uh, and so on. So it's uh, an extreme uh, in, the same, in the same field. So that even uh, uh, quite well-known uh, magazines in Italy have depicted uh, Tuscany like this, you know, the traditional Tuscany. Tuscany, 1959, as you see, uh, uh, and Tuscany 2009 with, uh, with the robot substitute, substituting, in this case, uh, the, the, the human worker for uh, some jobs that are not entirely uh, uh, pleasant, let's say. So it's a, it's a reality, so robot from the lab to reality. Now, uh, what happened in the 90s? In the 90s, there was a strong uh, um, uh, I would say interaction, and here there are many friends, uh, uh, Russ Taylor, Joseph Introcaso, and many others, who were working together. We were together at that time, in different places, of course, uh, uh, to uh, match robotics uh, with uh, uh, medicine. Uh, this had a number of applications, I'll just summarize two, the use of the development of hands, not robot hands, but prosthetic hands. As you know, prosthetic hands have, uh, this is, by the way, how medical robotics is now an increasing success for clean industrial field. But, you know, uh, I'm sorry, this, this slide was not at the right place. But uh, 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 those are capsules, you know, capsules that uh, uh, were able to explore the um, uh, uh, intestine, uh, uh, which are very close to clinical applications. So those are diagnostic tools. And the diagnostic tools uh, have evolved into innovative, uh, minimal invasive surgical systems. You know, this is uh, really at the forefront of research because uh, this is dealing not only to, uh, leading not only to uh, uh, minimal invasive, but really scarless surgery because uh, this uh, 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 trocar here can be inserted directly into the belly, actually, into the umbilicals of a person, leaving no visible scars. So it can be a revolution, but in order to do that, you need a lot of technology because you really want to build the operating room inside the patient by bringing inside vision, grasping tools, uh, uh, any kind of uh, accessories that have to be inserted through this tiny, relatively small hole in, in the belly. And this is how we simulated that and how finally we built this robot. That uh, is, uh, is the result of a European project, by the way, will be evaluated next week. So a very, very nice, uh, uh, um, uh, say, instrument. And this can be uh, further um, uh, de decreased. You know the, the dream of Fantastic Voyage, uh, Isaac Asimov? Well, you know, this is becoming increasingly close to be truth. Okay? I'm not saying true. Uh, here we are t uh, seeing how we want to miniaturize, you know, uh, moving from the meters to the centimeter to the millimeter scale and bringing millimetric robots for vascular diagnosis and therapy. And we have a project with that. So the, the, the millimeter capsule is uh, exploring uh, the um, um, vascular system, uh, visualizing and removing plaques, especially the vulnerable plaque that is uh, the one that really originates uh, uh, 
uh, uh, problems like infection. And the robot is moved, the, the, the capsule is moved uh, by means of uh, an external magnetic uh, uh, field uh, displaced by robots. So essentially, it's controlled contactless by a robot. And as you see, uh, uh, we are, and, and, and now robotics is not only the arm, you know, not only the hand, but it's an old system. Uh, you see here, all tools for imaging, locomotion, diagnostics, therapeutic, and so on. So a full system that uh, is uh, aimed to work, is aimed to really work and to represent the next generation of robotic tools. Uh, then, in the, but here we still are in mostly in the domain of engineering, okay? We are talking about engineering, really good technology, excellent engineering design, which is fundamental, of course, in robotics. But in the 90s also, uh, and in the next decade, something new happens. That is an increasing interest in the uh, in bio inspiration, you remember this uh, uh, sketch of biorobotics. So we biological systems increasingly before was occasional, occasional. And I must recognize to the Japanese colleagues. You know, Japanese Japan has been really leading this. And, and many of us criticized, uh, not me, I must say, say, well, this is nonsense, so what is uh, the science, so what is the engineering? Why well, the, the Japanese robotics research community was really pioneering, uh, not, on, not only, of course, but this, uh, this field, that is analyzing biological systems as a source of inspiration to design. And, 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 the, and, and, the real, and the reason for that, of course, is that since we want that robot operate in real world, they should be able to cope with uncertainty, to react quickly to changes in the environment. So what's the best model than biological system? Any biological system, from birds to fish to uh, mammals, of course, uh, uh, to, 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 to any, any kind of animals is, is a fantastic source of, of inspiration because of its ability to deal with the unstructured environment, to use perception, to explore reactive behavior, to interact also when needed with other beings, including human beings. And here, you know, we try to organize this approach in this way. Again, you know, we are talking about our interest in this case becoming biological system. What we can get from biological system model and uh, possible implementation of biomimetic robot. This biomimetic robot can have an application. Or we can get information from the biological system to develop, in summary, both a new technology and new science. You know, again, this idea of robotic science and engineering, as you see, is recurrent. In a way, is a mantra for some of us. Okay? It's a strong ambition uh, that you know, we really believe is, is the unique feature of robotics versus other engineering fields. The possibility of exploring this dualism that is actually not a dualism, but is an integration of different uh, uh, world and disciplines. And uh, um, so, however, uh, 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 there, there is, there is a, a warning, of course, a caveat, because natural selection is not engineering, and uh, that organisms that are capable of surviving are not necessarily optimal for their technical performance. So they need, in fact, to survive long enough to reproduce. So the models are never complete or correct. So there is a need to interpret with caution. So from the initial enthusiasm you know, to a more rational approach, and uh, a, a very uh, uh, well-known and, and friend, Robert Fuller, who's a biologist, always said, we think a blind copy is exactly what you don't want to do. You will fail miserably because nature is way too complex. So it's uh, uh, more than uh, just uh, 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 copying. So we have to choose the nature behavior of internet, extract the underlying three principles at the level of description that is actually possible to implement. This is the idea. And uh, so how 
my original project that you see on the left that were mostly engineering uh, driven and based became uh, gradually something more by adding the contribution of uh, the life science world, uh, particularly biology and also uh, uh, neuroscience. And the way this changed the uh, vision of uh, my laboratory that then became an institute is that all this, by bringing not only technological but also scientific results originated, a very, very strong increase in publications, very beneficial for my students, by the way, new curricula, new conferences, and even new industrial opportunities. So all together at different levels, let's say, but this is the vision. So you see engineering plus science, so results and a measurable output of the process, which is something that all of us has to, to consider. I go back to the hands that essentially uh, were uh, developed through a number of uh, projects, including the Neurobotics project that Professor Bertoz uh, uh, mentioned before. And, uh, you know, this is uh, 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 the, the ambitious project that uh, we conceived. That is uh, the development of uh, a, a, a hand that is obviously uh, strongly uh, biomimetic, not bio-inspired in this case, really mimetic, because it has to be the choice and functionality of the human hand, but also it is uh, uh, based, and this is the feature, it has many sensors and it has a connection with the nervous system. So this was the ambition that at that kind, uh, uh, those of us who thought about that were considered almost as crazy, but this is actually what makes the difference. Here you see the collaboration with Lund University, so our hand was controlled, in this case using EMG, that is muscle uh, signals, but then this became gradually uh, uh, even more ambitious, you see here uh, the case, and you see the, uh, the idea. Uh, to have a uh, efferent signal that is from the brain to the hand to control the hand and also uh, uh, inferent uh, 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 signal that is, uh, um, uh, the, uh, excuse me, afferent signal that are the ones that uh, come from the sensor to, to the brain. And uh, you can imagine the, the, the number of uh, engineering design of sensor effort that have been uh, 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 invested in this, but also that were produced as an outcome. Actually, uh, myself as a beginner and more my colleagues, uh, uh, Professor Maria Chiara Carrozza and uh, others uh, became really wor uh, known worldwide for this activity. So it was extremely productive uh, from an academic point of view. And also, you see, uh, according to Spectrum, we were, we are the, the one on the, on the right, you see, we have been really the first to be able to control a hand, essentially, uh, I mean, uh, this is a volunteer uh, amputee who tested first in the world uh, the control of the hand that was not implanted for, because at that time the hand was relatively large and not easily easy to wear, but now we have versions that are much smaller, like uh, uh, this one on the, on the right. Uh, this one is really uh, uh, wearable, let's say. And uh, he controlled uh, with uh, his uh, uh, brain directly the motion of uh, uh, the, some movements of the hand, and he could feel back the, the information detected by sensors during grasp. So, you know, from, uh, as you see, from rat to monkey to man, and if you look at just recently, I think on nature or science, uh, a new paper was presented or a further uh, a development of this, as it's uh, Donohue from Brown University, uh, 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 Van Desmart from DLR in, uh, in Germany, 
essentially making a further step so that is really controlling a robot in a systematic manner with real quadriplegic patients, uh, again, using uh, brain signal. So all this area of uh, brain interfaces is extremely interested. And by the way, Professor Bertoz is involved in new project in this area together with uh, Silvestro Michera, who is a colleague of mine. So this area has been extremely, um, say, productive also. Um, another case of biological inspiration is uh, uh, the one that originated in a, a full uh, uh, area of uh, uh, investigation in the field of painless uh, colonoscopy. You know, we started with uh, just an intuition that uh, looking at uh, a, a, a worm could be very interesting. Again, this was just an observation by a creative doctor. And then this uh, observation became an engineering development. So you see there not only the, the, the real worm, but also a robotic worm, a very early version of robotic worm. And we transformed uh, this uh, uh, concept into Okay, into an engineering uh, 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 instrument, and uh, you see that became even a, an industrial uh, 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 device that is uh, now uh, being used by uh, in clinical practice. You know, this is, uh, in my opinion, is a dream of an engineer. You know, starting just from uh, a, an idea, converting the idea into an engineering uh, object, uh, and then uh, testing the, the, uh, the object into, uh, uh, in, into in vitro, and then creating uh, a company, it's not mine, by the way, it's uh, by my, my students, and, and, uh, and uh, making an industrial uh, product that is, uh, at the end, uh, uh, solving or issues, alleviating. I mean, really, this is a painless colonoscopy system that has been tested in a number of patients, starting just from the observation of a worm. This demonstrates that in some cases, with all the caveat that I mentioned, this approach can work. And then there is another approach that is uh, uh, now extremely well known. Uh, this is the work of uh, my colleague uh, Cecilia Lasky and, and uh, co-workers that aims at investigating the octopus as another extraordinary uh, uh, tool for uh, uh, research, but also uh, technological innovation. We have also, for example, Tamar Flash from uh, Weissmann is a partner, but there are many colleagues uh, in Europe uh, uh, who are involved in this. As a model for software or all Pfeiffer somewhere, and a paradigm of embodied intelligence. You know, this paradigm is really something new in the field of robotics. It's something distinctive, it's something that makes a difference. It's something that, in a way, corresponds to what Rodney Brooks pro presented 30 years ago, uh, when he first said, essentially, that there cannot be intelligence, as we know, without a body. And this is uh, a, a consequence of this uh, uh, original idea, you know? And uh, so according to, to the classical approach, the focus is on the brain and central processing, while the modern approach is focusing not only on that, but on the interaction of the body with the environment and the statement that cognition is emergent from system environment interaction. So the body is fundamental. And then, uh, so adaptive behavior is not just control and computation but rather is the emergence of a complex dynamic interaction between the morphology of the body, including the materials, and the environment. So we are even talking, rather than artificial intelligence, you know, as separated by the body, to, of mechanical intelligence, or more properly, morphological computation, because the nature of the human mind, that is, is the assumption, is largely determined by the form, the, by the form and material act of the human body. And uh, there are cases, you see on the left uh, are 
uh, animals. And on the right is the humanoid. You see the humanoid is hesitating, uh, probing uh, the environment, uh, using sensors, trying to perceive, to make a model, to control, while on the left, uh, the animals, or a, 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 a animal like a robot, just jump and move because they rely on the elasticity, on the compliance, on the variable stiffness of their body. They are relying on the form of their body and on the uh, f uh, organization of their uh, body. And you see here the octopus. The octopus is an extraordinary creature because it has no rigid structure, so essentially a virtually infinite number of degrees of freedom. It can move in all directions, has the capability to squeeze into small aperture, is a variable and controllable stiffness, has manipulation and locomotion capabilities, and has a distributed control. Actually, it has few neurons in absolute, and most of them are in the R more than in the brain. So, you know, it's an it's a extraordinary uh, uh, object, let's say, creature. It's a dream of engineers, if you will, okay? How, how does it work? How can an octopus achieve this uh, 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 performance? Uh, of course, we have investigated here. We have our PhD student, Laura Maguire, who she, she really made all these measurements. This is a PhD, her PhD thesis, you know, to analyze in detail the force, uh, the position, the contraction time, using engineering means, even making echography to the, uh, to the, to the uh, arms. Uh, uh, so you see here the arrangement. And, and then we build the mock-up, that is uh, uh, arms that are inspired, and to some extent, uh, copy this uh, uh, behavior the, and the structure, actually, the structure. And all the uh, performance or the performance of the robot, who, uh, in this case, were measured. You see, we're talking about 40 newton, four, four kilograms force that in one, two second contraction time. And so something that is uh, quite useful. And then also the transverse actuator, because there are longitudinal and transversal actuators, were uh, uh, carefully investigated. So you see here all the analysis, you see from biological specification measured or observed by the anatomy observed, and possible solution and performance, uh, including the simulation of, of a muscular uh, hydrostat, that is the secret, using shape memory alloy actuators, a very nicely designed external braid. And you see here the structure and uh, the functioning and the contraction of this uh, uh, muscle of, uh, of uh, the unit. And here is, uh, is the entire arm. You know, there are new versions every few weeks, as you can imagine. And, um, and, uh, and then uh, uh, the, the entire octopus is being, uh, is materializing, not just the arm, but an entire robotic octopus. By the way, two arms are essentially devoted to manipulator. The other arms are essentially devoted to locomotion. This also was uh, uh, a result of the observations and the contributions of the zoologists and neuroscientists who work on that. And, uh, uh, here this shows uh, uh, the, the first multi-arm uh, uh, prototype. Of course, this is the real octopus. And you see how we investigated parts of the octopus. Because, as I said, the arm can be controlled in order by the octopus in order to have a variable stiffness. So it can move from uh, uh, soft to hard. Uh, easily, you know, this is the secret of uh, the dexterity, and we reproduce. You see in yellow here the parts that can be uh, stiffened or or softened, and uh, uh, by properly uh, arranging this, uh, one can even move uh, like the real octopus. And this is uh, the, the the case, uh, you know, how how this uh, uh, really biomimetic approach in this case. Uh, partly by spite, is, uh, is uh, implemented. You see all different uh, phases and, of course, uh, the engineering analysis. This is uh, the big project that is promoting and exploring this, uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, approach. I like this very much. Why? Because we are already have an application for the octopus. 
example. At the beginning, people said, well, what are you doing? What are you, are you investigating the octopus? And the answer was, just for curiosity, as a science, okay? We, we are, or we play as scientists in this context. Well, next step came when some colleagues said, why don't we use this approach to develop a new generation of endoscopes? We wrote a project and we are here in a new four-year project in which the aim is to develop a new surgical tool with the dexterity of the octopus arm that can be inserted through a small hole in the belly and move around like the octopus arm. So we are moving right now from science to engineering and hopefully to clinical applications. And you see this is a, 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 a not a, uh, uh, just a, a dream, but is a, is a reality. And together with other colleagues, more in the engineering and robotics area, developing uh, a, a, a real tool that can be used to this purpose. It's called stiff flop, by the way, the project that is inspired to this property of the author. Same things can be done in other domains, uh, like for the case of, of, lamp, of the uh, uh, lamp Petra, the lamprey. Lamprey is a very interesting animal, like uh, the um, salamander. You see there the lamprey here, 500 million years ago, uh, the salamander 300 million years ago. What? They are extremely interested because they possess all basic features of the vertebrate nervous system. So they are vertebrates. They are the, uh, our ancestors, if you, if you will. So, and they are very interesting models to investigate swimming and walking based on the central pattern generator model. So axial central pattern generator, no, just to swim in the lamprey on the left, swimming and walking in the salamander on the, on the right. So, and lamprey and salamander essentially are precursor from this point of view of, uh, of the mammals, like the cat and even humans. So, this is something that we learned, that we didn't know, <clears throat> working with uh, colleagues like uh, um, Stan Grillner from Karolinska Institute in the New Robotics Project, or with Jean-Marie Cabelgan with roboticists like uh, Oke okay, Eispert. And by the way, you see, this is uh, uh, the work of Eispert and colleagues on science mm -hmm. that essentially demonstrates that uh, robots, you see, robot-driven, there is a new paper on science last January on uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the tail uh, role in, in stabilization in lizards, so using robots. So robots are now accepted. I mean, this methodology of using robots for scientific experiment is no longer a dream, it's a reality, it's something that is accepted. Uh, uh, by the scientific community in so many cases that now, I mean, uh, is statistically relevant, this, the role of this approach. And, uh, you know, what we expect to do is to get a better model of goal-directed locomotion to investigate different patterns of behaviors, even motivational control now, and of course, to advance in IT technology, so hardware and control. So, very quickly, this is uh, how uh, uh, Stan Greener and colleagues uh, have uh, uh, modeled. And this is a uh, well-known uh, and uh, highly accepted work uh, in, uh, in the neuroscience community to uh, uh, model the goal-directed uh, locomotor system, different roles of different uh, uh, parts of the, of, uh, uh, and, uh, for example, the role of basal ganglia, the cortex, the hypothalamus, the sensory feedback, uh, and uh, the, a, 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 how decision-making and selection of behavior. So we already are more than just locomotion can be simulated. And in order to uh, or can be modeled. In order to prove this or to explore this, uh, we have collaborated by developing a lamprey fish robot. 
Uh, this is, by the way, the spinal neuromuscle machinery, the brain circuitry that are behind everything. And so this is part of the neuro, this is the neuroscience model, and this is the biomimetic artifact that includes a number of vertebras, a new kind of muscle-like actuation. This is uh, not really biomimetic, it's more bio-inspired because it's based on a magnetic, uh, uh, movable magnet approach. But, and this is the head with, uh, with, uh, with the cameras and with a vestibular system, because the lamprey has a vestibular system. And you see here uh, uh, the, 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 the work, uh, how the, the lamprey uh, works with the open loop driving, and, and here how it works with uh, stretch receptor, so that is with closed loop. And you see here how uh, the, the, the swimming of the lamprey can be much more, much smoother than, than uh, uh, before. And you see here the light tracking, so how the, uh, 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 the let's say, uh, behavior can be uh, investigated. In this case, uh, a, a light is moved in front of the, of the lamprey. You see, by the way, here, uh, my uh, colleague Cesare Stefanini, who has uh, essentially developed uh, this system, and here is Nelly Kurz, uh, is the uh, commissioner of the European Union interested in, uh, in this device. Uh, another area of interest is jumping mini robots. It's an area of where energy efficiency, negotiation and even terrains, uh, trade off between walking and flying uh, can be investigated. And here there could be a development, for example, robots for exploration, for rescue. And uh, we can investigate, again, from an engineering point of view, when jumping is convenient from an energy point of view. And this happens when the power-mass ratio uh, uh, essentially increases uh, as body size decreases. And so some animals, uh, we know, can, can jump, but not the elephant. There are many, uh, many uh, animals uh, uh, that can jump. Uh, and uh, there are some morphological adaptation. We can measure the kinematics data uh, out of that, and we can investigate uh, uh, using uh, uh, high-speed cameras, you know, the details of, uh, uh, of, the, of jump. This is uh, actually we have published on, on uh, uh, biology journals this observation because uh, there are interesting uh, discoveries on how uh, forces uh, and uh, acceleration essentially you know this uh, this uh, is uh, is a new information actually and this uh, shows how the uh, stress uh, in leg and substrate can be minimized with the proper arrangement of legs and uh, after understanding that we have developed uh, a model to produce a constant acceleration so a kinematic solution to, to do that. And, and then the mechanism. And you see here uh, uh, the, the jumping prototype that uh, is uh, insp inspired uh, 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 to, uh, by, by this. I hope it works. doesn't work, but uh, yeah. OK, and you see here uh, 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 the, 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 the jump of, uh, uh, of the robot. This is the mechanism. So you know, there is a. There is a, a, a lot of, of work uh, in order to uh, 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 simulate and, and to develop this uh, high-performance, bio-inspired uh, uh, jumping prototypes that we have done, referring and trying to imitate the same kind of uh, um, uh, uh, relations between uh, force, acceleration, velocity, as found uh, in uh, real animals. So you see here the, the real animal and uh, the, uh, the, the, the robot investigated uh, with the same tool and uh, measuring exactly the same uh, uh, parameters. So there's a kind, as I said, of scientific method to, to, uh, to this, that to, uh, to investigate uh, uh, biological system that is recurrent. And uh, just the last uh, uh, step is uh, the case of humanoid robots. Of course, the humanoid robots are probably the most dramatic uh, 
uh, area in which this can be investigated. A number of, of, of colleagues, uh, uh, including Yoshi Nakamura, Jean Paul Lomond, many others here, have been working, are working very nicely, uh, Professor Kawato, by the way, on, uh, on uh, uh, humanoid robots. Uh, and this is part of the story. We started uh, years ago with uh, uh, an early humanoid robots, and today we are working with uh, uh, a copy, let's say, of uh, the Waseda robot in the framework of a European project. Here we are collaborating with Professor Bertoz and his, uh, his uh, uh, team. And uh, you know, the idea, and, and also uh, using uh, uh, vision, of course, and predictive behavior. You know, essentially, we were inspired uh, totally by the approach uh, proposed uh, by uh, Professor Bertoz. You know, Professor Bertoz uh, has been uh, anticipating that uh, 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 say, actually, anticipation, predictive behavior, the role of head stabilization during the work, the role of uh, um, uh, the vestibular system are fundamental in order to obtain a human-like uh, uh, walking uh, uh, approach in uh, uh, robots. And uh, this is the kind of experiment that uh, we are doing, actually. Professor Bertoz, his colleagues, uh, my uh, student, Cecilia Lasky, all are working in, uh, jointly in uh, this demonstration study that starts from the analysis of uh, uh, the human behavior in this task and then move, you know, essentially the hypothesis you see on the left are visual, expected perception, the saccades, the predictive smooth pursuit, the gaze stabilization, then 3D target identification and trajectory planning. And all this uh, that is modeled in this uh, scheme here can be implemented and is being implemented. You know, this is just a very preliminary video of the robot. You see, there are no arms because this is not really what is needed to do that. And you see here uh, the target and uh, uh, the robot that is essentially looking, uh, ga is gazing at the target and moving uh, 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 in order to, to reach. And, and then it will uh, move around uh, in order to target the, 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 uh, the object. So again, all these models, or most of these models, are implemented in this uh, uh, structure. So again, the issue here is not just developing a humanoid robot, but is investigating uh, uh, the role of, uh, of uh, um, uh, this, uh, the, the, the models that I've said in humans and comparing human and robots, possibly gaining more knowledge and possibly developing better robots, as you know. So this integration between uh, neuroscience and, and robots is, uh, is, uh, is uh, extremely interesting. Like is this kind of even our experience you see here, uh, the Wabian uh, robot in Japan being tested uh, to evaluate, in, in a way, the, what they are doing here is simulating the pathological working of post-stroke patients, you know, in robots. So using the robots also to simulate the pathologies. Now, toward the conclusion, neuroscience. So what happens in the 2000s, you know, after the inspiration from medicine, the inspiration from biology, uh, really neuroscience uh, come in uh, uh, strongly, so that uh, this interaction between neuroscience and robots uh, become really systematic. In our work, you know, really what we do in our laboratory is to do this systematically, you know, to try to uh, not only implement neuroscience models and to use model to validate, a robot to validate the model, but to co-design robots. Uh, what I showed before uh, with the Robosome project is in a way something similar to that. So we, what we would like to do is to incorporate the neuroscience models into the design of new generation of robots. This is a very ambitious uh, goal, of course, and to do this uh, in, a, in, a, in a systematic and sequential, sequential way. So you see, this is really the ambition, not only uh, if, uh, roboticists that ask uh, one neuroscientist to give a hint, but really a co-work 
of uh, roboticists and neuroscience uh, in order to develop so new solutions uh, with high performance and applications and new science also. Obviously, we want to have an added value to, to this. And uh, this is what uh, uh, Professor Berto was mentioning before. But actually, it's even more what you said, because uh, here we have, you see, it's interesting. We worked together for five years, uh, six teams of roboticists and nine teams of neuroscience. So the majority was neuro neuroscience. I think this is unique. And, and I was the coordinator of the project. Professor Bertoz was the coordinator of this team of neuroscience. And you have a hard time, and me too, to uh, work, uh, harmonize together, because you know neuroscientists uh, are prima, do prima donnas, as we, we know, and uh, you know are real ambitious um, scientists. Okay, and uh, so we learn a lot, of course. But it was very interesting from an educational point of view. And you can read the name; is the Gotha of uh, neuroscience in, in Europe, of course, there are also other people. And by the way, there are other persons like uh, John Donoghue from Brown University. We collaborated, of course, Professor Takanisha at that time. And you know, uh, uh, some of the activities that were uh, generated afterwards, because you know, this is the goal we pursued working together for many years, to go beyond current technology in teleoperation beyond the current technology in orthesis, beyond current technology in prosthesis. Of course, in four years, uh, we cannot do everything, but certainly what we did is incredible because we essentially generated a number of scientific problems that was impressive. You see, this is uh, a, a, an overview of uh, the input, but especially of the outputs of the project. I think this is really what is most important. Uh, uh, we really generated many new ideas by working together. And what is more is that put these ideas at work. Because, you know, those are the ideas and those are the projects. So those are the, uh, the, the concept and this is the money to do, the, to do this work. So we were able not only to conceive ideas but also to convince reviewers that these ideas are so good that they deserve to be funded. So essentially, this project was a sort of incubator of a number of new opportunities. And this is really the message I would like to leave. You know, this is something that is extremely effective, not just to writing one or two papers or to co-tutor one or two students, but really to create a community that generates new knowledge. And uh, yeah, okay, this is uh, also the evolution of all these projects. And, and, uh, uh, and, and now really go to quickly to, to, to the conclusion, I still have a few minutes to understand. So uh, uh, this is the story of how the flagship proposal was originated. You know, this is very important, it's here. So it shows that uh, the, this idea of proposing to the European Union a new big project in robotics does not come from just the scratch. We have built the condition to do that. So we are ambitious, but we are credible because we have built all this uh, intellectual story, if you will, scientific story. And this holds, of course, in Europe, but I should say it's true in the world. You will, we will see from our colleagues from Japan, our, our colleagues from the US, our colleagues from Europe, that is true that robotics is now generating this new science, or at least new scientific hypotheses, and of course, new technology to uh, provide uh, uh, real solutions. So this is the, the, the final step of the story, as I show. So the robot companion for citizen proposal that come, if you will, from some very basic consideration. You know, in general, we should say that personal societal needs have pushed technological progress through history. Um, so why uh, Romans did not have many machines except the war machines? Because they have slaves, okay? like the Greeks. Why Greeks were good philosophers? Because they have slaves. But getting slaves was not very easy, you know, because people didn't want to become slaves first, and because, uh, you know, especially after Christ, this was considered as not ethical. 
okay? Before, it, no problem. Um, so humans had to invent machines to alleviate fatigue and reduce risk. And, but the problem is, is current technology sufficient to address some very demanding challenges in the present for the future? This is a starting point, as also Jean-Paul pointed out. We have two ways. So one way is to work by road, road maps. We have good road maps. Every country has good road maps. So we have European road maps, American road maps, Japanese road maps, Korean road maps. But, and so we could pr progress through incremental innovation, what in electronics, microelectronics called the Moore's law. You know, every 18 months, uh, the power process, uh, uh, powering process of uh, microelectronic circuit doubles. It is an empirical law of the, of the founder or president of Intel, Moore law. And we can get a steady progress, they're fine. Uh, in fact, we may consider a progress in robotics, and one could say, yes, we can, by following this approach, uh, uh, having a very effective machine, true. But the question is, is there a way to accelerate this process? To accelerate this process uh, to develop new machines uh, more quickly that are affordable, sustainable, and dependable. These three words are very important. Huh? Affordable means that everybody could buy. Sustainable, that they don't drain all energy from uh, your apartment, for example. Dependable, that they work like a TV set that we sw switch on and forget for 10 years. <laughs> this is uh, what people would like to have, and we are far from. So, uh, lesson, surgery. In, the, in surgery, you know, already 5,000 years before Christ, there was brain surgery, but only with Pasteur, Jean-Paul mentioned. Pasteur is really a very interesting part because he was a Nobel Prize winner. He is a scientist. He discovered the existence of bacteria. At the same time, he was able, or thanks to, he was able to, sa to save a million lives by inventing. So he was a discoverer, but at the same time, if you will, was an inventor or inventor of solutions that were extremely useful to people. So that modern surgery was born. So modern surgery, meaning non invasive surgery, robotic surgery, are here thanks to science, to scientific discoveries, like the cellular phone. This is how Nokia presented their business. Now not very successful, unfortunately, but it was very successful at the time thanks to mathematics and physics. So they really uh, state that their fortune relies on scientific discoveries. So this is our, our answer to the hypothesis. Is there a way to accelerate this process? And the answer can be yes, by introducing more science into the engineering process. So this is the idea. Uh, um, uh, Jean-Paul Omond presented this. And you know, this essentially means that these three areas, you know, are covered by different programs in the uh, uh, European Union, and that FET, Future and Emerging Technology, is covering use inspired basic research. That, as you see, try to bridge science to engineering. This is really our Compass, if you will, is our the way of looking uh, 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 in front end. This is how the commission launched. Actually, they, there was a call, uh, 26 proposals were presented, 26 uh, were accepted. Robert Companion was one of those, you know, and this is, I think, uh, is already a victory because we had to compete with people who, like uh, the Nobel Prize winners for the graphene or other very respected scientists. So all the other proposals are very strong. And here we are talking about the 10 year, a big budget, uh, launch expected in 2013. And the keywords we have to respect are ambition, impact, integration, plausibility of, of the proposal. So what is our vision? Our vision is to 
stay here. So our proposal will try to innovate and accelerate the uh, achievement of solutions, bridging and taking inspiration from uh, or using science. And you see the bridge that we have envisaged with a team of colleagues who are working hard on this proposal. There are many here in the, in, in the audience, so I wish to thank all of them. Uh, and so, bridging science with application, bridging science with engineering, and uh, starting from a problem that is a sustainable welfare at ha home, in the environment, in urban, in economy, in factories, and <clears throat> trying to, yeah, this is the goal, trying to pursue this. You know, I like very much this, uh, I, I wrote that, I must say, but I like very much, because in a way is what really would like to achieve, you know, to go beyond the steady progress, you know, to introduce breakthrough, to introduce innovation. Well, I must say that um, Europe is not so good in that, also Japan, uh, not that much, the US are really good in doing this. It's a very interesting point. In creating a favorable environment for unexpected, uh, roadmap-less, <laughs> yeah, roadmap-less uh, uh, solution. And uh, so, uh, as I, I, I skip this, uh, uh, this is the vision, by the way. I, I, maybe I'll just use this. So what we want to do is to unveil the secrets of natural simplexity, morphological computation, and sensing, and to translate this knowledge into design principle and fabrication technology. So you see, the idea is to bridge scientific knowledge that resides in these pillars one is simplexity. Yeah, it, in a way, it, it, it synthesizes the secrets. Yesterday we had a full day workshop and discussion on that. That is used by natural systems to make complex problems more simple to track. That doesn't mean so to find a simple solution, but in a way to be able to merge uh, 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 simplicity with complexity. And this, we have a tradition in that. You know, Matt Mason, who is here, how we chose it, Antonio Bicchi, Ken Goldberg, and others have investigated this calling minimalistic approach. And here we can do this uh, in different areas, you know, design, system modeling, information processing. And, and the second area we already discussed is morphological computation. You know, uh, just uh, look at this, uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, just a demonstration. This is the work of uh, Mark Rutkowski, uh, uh, Bob Fool. Uh, essentially, in, you know, using a very, very simple control system to, uh, but just uh, uh, relying on the mechanical design, essentially on the preflexes, to make the system very robust. And this can be exploited in other ways uh, to save energy or, uh, you know, to, to, um, to make effective use of uh, shape. This is already shown. Um, maybe I, I just go to the, to the conclusion probably. Another pillar is sensing, that is the integration of perception, cognition, emotion, feeling, and action that can make robots aware of self, others, and environment. This is a new approach that is essentially trying to go beyond the traditional approach of dividing the brain function to, into modules. And materials, energy, uh, very ambitious uh, goals using the most advanced uh, discoveries in uh, nanomaterials, in new energy sources, uh, in new sensors, in new actuators, and, and so on. And Keeping into so very ambitious roadmaps in terms of power, sensor, and uh, overall system specifications. Society is a key pillar. We want to be uh, to interact with all stakeholders uh, very, very closely. And uh, uh, just let me go here. Uh, this is how the project will be organized. So a number of uh, modules, essentially 
five pillars uh, with uh, cross links dealing to new fabrication, I mean, to new natural principles and new design principles, to integration capabilities, to new fabrication and attention to needs and expectation, and to generate five different platforms uh, synthesized uh, in this kind of uh, representation. That, of course, is not uh, at all uh, the final one, just showing that uh, we would like to develop a number of different robot companions. And uh, this shows uh, how this will be essentially implemented as an example, starting from existing platforms and introducing new solutions gradually till the final uh, revolution, it's implementation. Very important, from, a from an engineering point of view, we want to go be uh, beyond the mechatronics, okay? So to simplify and reduce the cost. This is a very important engineering achievement. And uh, like a man on the moon, we should like that uh, in, uh, in uh, 10 years from now, we would have a number of uh, spin-off uh, and uh, fallout uh, from these, uh, and many industrial sectors interested, not only robotics. Uh, to conclude, um, yeah, we are working on this, but this, is, uh, this will be a truly European project, but also involving a number of, uh, of, uh, of partners from all over the world. We already have uh, contact with uh, many, many different countries. So the conclusion is that what is really important, in my opinion, is the long-term vision, the systematic connection between engineering and science, the pursuit of disruptive innovation, and a global, truly global robotic program. And uh, thank you for your attention.